Picture the dilemma of Melinda Elkins. Her mother has been murdered, and the only surviving witness is her six-year-old niece pointing a finger at her husband. He looked like my Uncle Clarence. He sounded like Uncle Clarence. He was about the same height. What happened? I didn't break the law. I didn't commit no crime. It is up to her alone to solve this case and bring the real killer to justice. Join us as we unwrap how Melinda Elkins solved the murder of her mother on her own. How could you dare stick up for someone that just killed your mother? I was not guilty, and I was going to somehow prove that. Six-year-old Brooke Sutton was the only surviving witness to the gruesome murder of her grandmother, Judy Johnson. On June 7, 1998, Brooke woke up to an intruder while she slept in her grandmother's bed. When she got up to look, the intruder saw her and put her through unimaginable horrors. Enduring severe physical abuse and sexual assault herself, little Brooke shocked everyone when she named her uncle, Clarence Elkins, as the attacker. Brooke was spending the night at her grandmother, Judy Johnson's house, the only granddaughter of the family. She had a special bond with Judy. Judy had two daughters, Melinda and April. Judy had adopted Melinda because she was unable to have children at the time. But, unknown to them, Melinda was one of the infamous Dr. Hicks black market babies, adopted through a man who stole children and essentially sold them for $1,000 each, taking it as an adoption fee. But that story would reveal itself decades later, as Melinda would locate her brother. Melinda was married to Clarence Elkins, and Judy disapproved of the relationship quite openly, knowing her daughter deserved better. On the other hand, Judy adored April's daughter, Brooke, and was quite satisfied with her family. When little Brooke woke up to the intruder attacking her grandmother in the living room, she was terrified. Her tiny little feet followed him into the kitchen, where he turned around and saw her running from him. She did what any small child does, went back to bed and hid under the covers. Unfortunately for her, the monster had already seen her. He struck her, knocking her unconscious. After assaulting her, he slit her neck and left her for dead. Hours later, at 7 a.m., incredibly, Brooke opened her eyes. She tried to wake her grandmother up, but to no avail. Covering herself with her grandmother's robe, she went to get the phone, finding it lying outside in the bushes. The six-year-old called the friend's house, getting the answering machine. managed to get to a neighbor, Tanya Brazel's house. Tanya saw the battered child wrapped in a nightgown and simply said she was cooking breakfast for her children and that she should wait outside on the porch. Brooke waited outside for nearly an hour. This behavior is highly surprising considering that Brooke played with Tanya's daughters and Brooke obviously looked battered and bruised, not to mention she had just been home alone with a dead body. No mother can find it in their heart to treat a child so coldly, yet that's what Tanya did. 45 minutes later, Tanya drove Brooke home, let her in the house, and left. Brooke's father immediately went to Judy's house to investigate and called the police. Okay, sir, just calm down. My mother-in-law has been stabbed. She's laying here on the floor. She's dead. Brooke had told Tanya that the man who attacked her looked like Uncle Clarence, and that's exactly what she told Brooke's mother, April. This information was passed on to the officers. April immediately got on board with Brooke's testimony, sending Clarence to jail. Clarence Elkins would go on to spend more than six years in prison, but his wife, Melinda, would pursue his innocence relentlessly until finally, one day, she uncovered the truth. Melinda Elkins believed her husband was completely innocent of the crime. She felt that the six-year-old was confused. This caused a rift in the family, 
April was upset that Melinda would side with a killer instead of her own niece. Clarence said he was out drinking till about 2.40 a.m. Sunday morning, and Melinda corroborated because she was up taking care of one of her sons who was sick. Unfortunately for Clarence, the attack was placed between 2.30 and 2.50 a.m., yet the couple's home was over an hour's drive from Judy Johnson's house, so it did not make sense that he could do what he did and be back by 2.40 a.m. Aside from that, there was no DNA evidence linking Clarence to the crime. Officers had lifted pieces of hair from Judy's body, but they were excluded from prosecuting evidence, as it was assumed to have either come from Judy or Clarence. Prosecutors had no need for DNA analysis, as they had a six-year-old eyewitness pointing at her alleged assailant. Convicted on June 10, 1999, Clarence was sentenced to two terms of life in prison and wouldn't be up for parole till 2054. Melinda resolved to take the investigation into her own hands in order to vindicate her husband. For a novice like her, the task seemed impossible. Where even seasoned detectives had failed to name the killer, what advantage could she possibly possess to crack the case? Melinda wanted to try DNA tests. Back then, DNA analysis was a new forensic technology, and Melinda was determined to incorporate it to solve her mother's murder. Her sons feared the killer would come after them once he realized she was investigating the matter. She made a list of suspects and went undercover, frequenting bars, getting their DNA like a cigarette butt, a used napkin, or just a glass, stocking it all in her freezer. An organization named Truth and Justice guided her to Martin Yant, an investigative journalist who would help her solve the case. Martin pointed out that during the cross-examination, Brooke admitted not getting a good look at the killer. People ignored her trauma, oxygen deprivation, a severe head injury, all on a little six-year-old. No one questioned her potential confusion. Furthermore, Melinda dug around the bush where Brooke had found the phone. Police had missed some vital clues. The skeleton of their missing cat was found with a string of Christmas lights around her neck, and there was a rusted sea clamp, a possible murder weapon. Three years after Clarence had gone to jail, Judy Johnson's daughters made amends. In an emotional reunion, Brooke, now nine years old, admitted that she had tried to tell everyone the killer looked like Uncle Clarence, not that he was Uncle Clarence. She also told them he had brown eyes, not blue like Clarence's. Who'd you say it was? My Uncle Clarence. Why would you say it was Uncle Clarence? Because it looked like him. But do you think so today? No. Okay. In another stroke of luck, a friend of Judy Johnson provided Melinda with a home video of a wedding. Melinda noticed a man, 30 years younger than Judy, quite obviously flirting with her throughout the wedding. The friend revealed the 29-year-old man named Ryle Rush had a crush on Judy's mother, despite the age difference. April discreetly spoke to his roommate and revealed the man had marks all over his back as though someone had clawed at him. In a video from Judy's funeral, Martin noticed Ryle was indeed nervous, and there were scratches all over his face. On appeal, judges did not overturn their sentence because they felt Brooke had been schooled on what to say, and her views had been manipulated to free her uncle. Ryle, on the other hand, cooperated and voluntarily submitted a saliva sample for DNA testing. Initially, the DNA test was too expensive for Melinda to afford. She managed to raise $40,000, but Martin and Melinda found an organization, the Innocence Project, which had two of their students do two samples for $25,000 in 2003. The test revealed that the DNA didn't match with Clarence Elkins or Ryle Rush. Furthermore, their appeal for Clarence was denied because the jury had convicted him without DNA evidence. It was back to square one for Melinda. Two years later, just when all seemed lost, Martin realized all this time, Judy had been living next door to a convicted offender, Earl Mann. 
Earl had been released from prison in June 1998, two days before the murder. He was convicted of sexually assaulting his daughters in 2002. Melinda realized he was the boyfriend of none other than Tanya Brazel, the woman Little Brook had gone to for help. It also made sense why Tanya hadn't let Brooke into the house, called the police, or checked on Judy. She knew what Earl was capable of. Tanya had made Brooke change her statement from somebody killed grandma to Uncle Clarence. Shockingly, Earl Mann was in the same prison as Clarence, Mansfield Correctional Institution, a mixed security state prison for men in Ohio. The two shared the same prison pod. He had been convicted of robberies and assault in 2005. Clarence managed to get a cigarette butt for DNA extraction, just in time, too, because Earl was transferred two days later. The results matched. After six years of hard work, Melinda had finally identified the monster that destroyed her family. Tanya Brazel testified that Earl had returned home injured and had claimed he slept with a wild woman. When Brooks showed up the next day, he was furious and told Tanya not to let her in. Tanya was in a severely abusive relationship, and while she knew something was wrong, she was unable to act on it. Melinda was finally successful in clearing Clarence's name. Clarence Elkins was freed on December 15, 2005. In 2009, he received $5.25 million in damages for the police's failure to investigate a convicted sex offender next door to the murdered woman. In 1999, while drunk during an arrest, Earl had asked the police why they hadn't arrested him for the murder of Judy Johnson, a huge red flag that the police did not pursue. In August 2008, Earl pled guilty to the charges of aggravated murder, attempted murder, aggravated burglary, and rape, receiving a life sentence without parole. Despite their divorce in 2007, Melinda and Clarence maintained a strong friendship. Melinda wanted to find the real culprit and free an innocent man, and her unwavering resilience made it all possible. In 2019, Melinda used DNA technology once more to find her real family. Taken at birth, she had been sold for adoption without her family's consent. She was reunited with her brother. Today, the family is close and at peace, finally identifying their mother's murderer. It is unfortunate that of all the houses on the street, Little Brooke walked into the house of her assailant. One tainted statement further broke down her family. Thanks to Melinda's faith in forensic technology, and her determination, a dangerous sex offender and killer is now behind bars.